The Virgin Suicides is a novel published in 1993 by Jeffrey Eugenitz and later adapted into one of my favorite movies in 1999 by Sofia Coppola. However, the film adaptation glosses over the deeper messaging in the novel in preference for focusing on the Lisbon girl's teenage melancholy. Although this is what makes the Virgin Suicides film so relatable, it also lacks for answers as to why the girls were so melancholic in the first place, and instead romanticizes the feeling for an ignorant demographic of young girls who thus believe the natural state of girlhood is sadness. In this video essay, I'll explore themes touched upon in the novel and give greater context for why the Lisbon girls, spoiler alert, eventually took their lives. The Virgin Suicides is set in Gross Point, Michigan, on the border of Detroit in 1975. Following the 1967 Detroit riot, which was one of the deadliest and most destructive riots spanning five days. These riots were in part due to the declining automotive industry, costing locals 130,000 manufacturing jobs and pushing them into the suburbs for better prospects. Unemployment rates reached 10% and many iconic American brands like Hudson, Packard, and Studebaker, alongside several other small manufacturing companies, went out of business. GM, Ford, and Chrysler opened up 25 new auto plants in the suburbs, but barely survived the collapse. Automation stole most assembly line jobs, and where once Detroit promised high-paying industrial jobs with plenty of entry-level opportunity for residents, now the city had turned into an urban shell of its former glory. It was described as the mighty engine of American glory, and testament to American ingenuity, but now it's an urban ghost town filled with rotting buildings and a polluted skyline. This economic decline followed the Vietnam War and World War II, with World War II pointedly mentioned in The Virgin Suicides as a switch point in American society. After World War II, religiosity in the United States grew as a consequence of both the trauma endured from World War II and the rising atheist presence of communism globally. The United States began seeing itself as a Christian nation, with President Eisenhower adding, quote unquote, under God, to the Pledge of Allegiance. However, that doesn't mean the United States wasn't a Christian nation before. The Liberty Bell has Leviticus 2510 etched into its bronze, and the U.S. Constitution was founded on biblical standards with every founding father practicing one form of Christianity or another. The United States doubled down on their Christian values during an economically hostile period where traditional values had lost out to early 1900s consumerism, and the effects were evident during the 1960s, particularly after the Vietnam War, where baby boomers rebelled against their parents' society and religiosity declined in the United States. It dropped only to a certain point, but was sustained during the 1970s. However, the socioeconomic changes took its toll on the public, and an identity crisis remedied through periodic bouts of massive consumerism ensued. This hollowed out the cultural and consequently individual identities within the United States, leaving particularly teenagers very confused about their role in the world. Jeffrey Eugenitz, the author of Virgin Suicides and a native of Detroit, was born in 1960. He was inspired to write the novel when a teenage babysitter confessed to him that she and her friends considered doing a suicide pact, but thought better of it, which made him wonder why teenagers would consider taking their lives like that. He didn't understand why he wrote the novel until he realized he felt haunted by Detroit's decline, having watched it deteriorate from its former glory into a wasteland throughout his adolescence. Eugenitz himself was raised Greek Orthodox, but wasn't devout and instead explored transcendental meditation during his adolescence, only to return back to Christianity during the 80s, where he gravitated towards Catholicism and particularly fell in love with the meditative and egalitarian nature of Quakerism. He also volunteered in Calcutta with Mother Teresa after he graduated from Brown University, but he commented on his experience, honestly admitting he didn't have the emotional stamina for the work like others did. He chose to study at Brown University because of their professor, John Hawkes, who was heavily influenced by Vladimir Nabokov, one of my personal favorite writers. But Eugenids observes how his generation was raised backwards. We were weaned on experimental writing before ever reading much of the 19th century literature the modernists and postmodernists were reacting against. This new world, old world friction, is referenced in The Virgin Suicides, as the entire novel explores the disintegration of an old world and its costly effects on the younger population. Cecilia, Lux, Bonnie, Mary, and Therese were the five teenage daughters of Mr. Lisbon, a math teacher at their high school, and Mrs. Lisbon, a devout Catholic and stay-at-home mom. The Lisbons were protective of their daughters and, despite liberal interpretations of the movie, weren't actually that strict. Cecilia had a Zodiac mobile, tarot cards, and loved studying the occult. Lux had a large, hard rock record collection and expressed groupie-like sentiments, falling in love with every boy she saw and was still allowed to have boys over with the Lisbon supervision. Bonnie expressed more socialist sentiments studying Simone Well, a Christian mystic and Marxist, and was devoted to her studies alongside the other two older Lisbon sisters, Mary and Therese, who were more scientifically inclined. 
The older sisters didn't have as many complexes as the younger sisters, mostly because they weren't boy crazy, having matured and focused on more future-oriented subjects. This difference stands in contrast to the girls their age who were more modern, having access to makeup and women's magazines, which were banned in the Lisbon household after Mrs. Lisbon noted a magazine making reference to how a girl can properly orgasm. Mrs. Lisbon held healthier standards for her daughters, wanting them to socialize with boys only during the day, in public, and with supervision, especially since, as a mother, she wanted to keep her daughters protected from boys. However, Mrs. Lisbon was very old school for her rearing tactics and was considered too uptight because her daughters weren't allowed to attend house parties where kids routinely got drunk and made a mess of the house or go on dates instead of boys joining their family for dinner. This dating style stands in contrast to figures like Trip Fontaine, who was notably raised in a more modern way with two fathers, no religious presence, and access to alcohol since his early adolescence. Cecilia was the first to go. Cecilia was the first to go. Cecilia was considered the weird one of the family. She was the type of girls where boys kept their feelings for her a secret because they thought it was embarrassing. When an Italian boy moved into town, Dominic, Cecilia developed a small crush on him, especially after he feigned a suicide attempt after his crush, Diana Porter, moved away for the summer by jumping off his roof because he couldn't be with her. When Diana Porter left on vacation in Switzerland, Dominic denounced God. And to prove the validity of his love, he jumped off the roof of his relative's house. Cecilia noted how stupid he was for jumping over Diana Porter in her diary, but later started delving into ancient Roman history, observing how suicide was practiced by cynics over losing a lover, like in the case of Dominic, or in the school of Stoics, as a refusal to live in the new world, particularly when Caesar took power. It was tradition in ancient Rome to cut one's veins like Seneca the Younger, who calmly took his own life, where Tacitus, a Roman historian notes, he was then carried into a bath with the steam of which he was suffocated and he was burnt without any of the usual funeral rites. So he had directed in a codicil of his will, even when in the height of his wealth and power, he was thinking of life's close. This parallels Cecilia's first attempt at death while wearing a wedding dress, slitting her wrists like a stoic while taking a bath, and when they found her afloat in her pink pool with the yellow eyes of someone possessed and her small body giving off the odor of a mature woman, the paramedics had been so frightened by her tranquility that they had stood mesmerized. However, this attempt fails, and Cecilia is taken to a therapist who chastises the Lisbons for their strict parenting and says, at 13, Cecilia should be allowed to wear the sort of makeup popular among girls her age in order to bond with them. The aping of shared customs is an indispensable step in the process of individuation. Cecilia demonstrates individuation through her interest in the occult instead of Christianity, which her parents allow, and through refusing the hospital gown and keeping her wedding dress on during her treatment. But her conforming to modern standards wasn't the answer to her pain. In fact, it was the cause of her pain. Mrs. Lisbon throws a house party for the girls and lets them invite whichever boys they want as an attempt to help Cecilia bond more with the other kids. She's allowed to wear makeup, which the other boys remarked upon saying she looked like a harlot, but the boys feel out of place because the house party was supervised, didn't have alcohol, and was pretty tame. Cecilia remains in the background while the boys start teasing a local neighbor kid with Down syndrome to entertain the Lisbon girls and gain their favor. Lux shows Joe, the kid with Down syndrome, affection, while Cecilia quietly walks away and asks her mom's permission to go upstairs. Her mom is concerned because they threw the party for Cecilia, but she allows Cecilia to leave after the girl pulls off her bandages. Cecilia quietly goes upstairs, drinks some peach juice, stands outside for a bit, goes back inside, walks up to her room, stands in her window, meanwhile a neighbor waves hello and turns away to attend to his wife, and then Cecilia jumps, impaling herself through the heart on her family's iron fence. The party rushes out after hearing the thud, quickly understanding what Cecilia might have done, as they find their father trying to pull her body off the fence. She's still wearing her wedding dress. Another stoic example of a similar death is Cato the Younger, who refused to live under Caesar's new regime. So as Plutarch notes, Cato drew his sword from its sheath and stabbed himself below the breast. His thrust, however, was somewhat feeble, and he did not at once dispatch himself. His servants heard the noise and cried out, and his son at once ran in, together with his friends. A physician went to him and tried to replace his bowels, which remained uninjured, and to sew up the wound. Accordingly, when Cato recovered and became aware of this, he pushed the physician away, tore his bowels with his hand, rent the wound still more, and so died. 
Cecilia didn't end her life over Dominic, as some believed, since she wrote down in her diary how silly it is to end one's life over a crush, which was a stoic belief, thinking it dishonorable to end your life over love. She writes in her diary about Indians paddling their canoes in polluted streams, despair over the neighborhood elm trees getting cut down, observing the trees aren't all sick and the city is just trying to make everything flat, references to Illuminati conspiracy theories, the military industrial complex, and generally observing how the world around her was coming to an end and a new enslaving world was taking hold. Although her parents took logical precautions like making her take baths with the door slightly open to check in on her, the therapist told the parents Cecilia needed as much privacy as possible for her mental health. Cecilia wasn't sad or bothered before or during the party. She participated in hanging up the balloons and just listened to sad Celtic music like usual. Like the Stoics though, she knew she didn't belong to the new world. The contrast was probably made worse by the party. Let alone the therapist suggesting that she conform to beauty rituals of her fellow peers who, like Lux, were boy obsessed. Cecilia held a card from the Virgin Mary during her first attempt, and on the back it said, The Virgin Mary has been appearing in our city, bringing her message of peace to a crumbling world. As in Lourdes and Fatima, Our Lady has granted her presence to people just like you. This prompted Mr. Lisbon to blaspheme for the first time and start losing his faith, but Mrs. Lisbon remained devout, and her maternal instinct over the girls proved very necessary. When Cecilia was in her casket, one of the funeral parlor boys bragged about trying to fondle her breast, and every boy in town showed predatory intentions towards the girls, including sifting through their trash to find used tampons, looking for bras and secret makeup stashes, and stealing stuff from their trash for their collection. These attempts wouldn't make much of an impact on the three older Lisbon girls, since they were more academically minded, but this attention proved fatal for Lux, the hopeless romantic, who showed every boy affection in the hopes of finding true love. Where Cecilia was an old soul who felt like she didn't belong to the new world and consequently ended up taking her life, Lux, on the other hand, was a old romantic who likewise tragically found out that her perception or her definition of love didn't exist in this new world. Mark Anthony's death was frowned upon because he took his life over love. He looked at Eros and said, Do now that which I've engaged you to do. Fulfill your promise and put me out of my misery. Eros drew his sword as if to slay Anthony, but instead he suddenly stabbed and killed himself, as he fell dead. Anthony looked down at him and said, It is well done, Eros. You've shown your master how to do that which he must now do for himself. Lux tried adopting modern beauty trends, sneaking makeup around her mother to make herself look more attractive, and wrote the names of random boys she liked on the inside of her underwear and bras to attract those boys. Her mother had to constantly wash them out and keep an eye on her, so she didn't sneak off later commenting how she didn't punish her daughters punitively, but rather tried protecting them from boys who only want one thing, and it's not love. After the death of Cecilia, the boys observed how quietly yet respectfully their parents helped the Lisbons, particularly in removing the iron fence from their front yard. Our parents said nothing, so that we sensed how ancient they were, how accustomed to trauma, depression, and wars. We realized the version of the world they rendered for us was not the world they really believed in, and that for all their caretaking and bitching about crabgrass, they didn't give a damn about lawns. Their fathers fought in World War II and sent love letters back home to their current wives, who they now raised families with in the suburbs. They were all practicing Christians from different denominations and were raised during a time where rules around love were more strictly observed, but they all compromised on their faiths in one way or another. The Lisbons listened to Protestant music despite being Catholics. Divorce was becoming more and more common in the neighborhood, creating confusion and disorder since people observed how the divorcees still loved their first spouses and people stopped commonly attending church. Lux, like her sister, was also misplaced. The rise in American consumerism replaced traditional cultural practices with more profitable yet empty exchanges and treated girls' bodies as sexual objects. Hence, women's magazines teaching girls how to climax, which stands in contrast to the collected Virgin Mary cards the girls possessed. One professor notes, Capitalism has resulted in material well-being, but spiritual bankruptcy. This cultural disintegration, as the boys noted, made local rituals like burning raked lawn leaves in a pile together die out, but we'll cover this theme a little more later. Lux fell madly in love with Trip Fontaine, who was described as a gentleman. He kept his distance from Lux until he brushed his arm against hers in the auditorium and told her he was going to ask her father to go on a date with her. This was the status quo for dating etiquette during the 1930s and 40s, where boys were expected to ask a girl's parents for permission to go out with their daughter. This was seen as a form of protection to ensure their daughter wasn't tricked into loving someone with less than noble intentions, let alone actively getting hurt by a stranger. Tripp wasn't allowed to take Lux on a one-on-one -on -one date, especially in his own car, because that risked way too much chance for him to take advantage of her. 
so he was able to convince the Lisbon parents to let him take their daughter out on a date by suggesting a group outing with all her sisters and friends. They agreed, believing it might be good for the girls to socialize and go out, although Mrs. Lisbon still had her reservations. This parallels Cecilia's party where Mrs. Lisbon agreed to the therapist's counsel letting Cecilia wear makeup and hang out with boys, but yet this advice proved not only useless, but even fatal. Trip Fontaine wasn't a gentleman, but rather just a quiet and attractive young boy. His silence made him attractive because he wouldn't brag to others about his sexual exploits, but it was probably a consequence of his first sexual encounter. His father left his mother for a man, and on vacation with his father and his father's boyfriend, they left him alone at a bar where a 37-year-old divorced female bartender got him drunk at 14 and took advantage of him. Afterwards, he remained very quiet and never spoke about the incident, but became very nostalgic about the event, changing his wardrobe and bedroom to reflect the beach. He soon developed drug dependencies on alcohol, which his father provided for him, and weed, which hurt his academic performance since he constantly ditched class to smoke, in it, to smoke it in his car. He also developed a trauma response from the event where he became hypersexual to the further detriment of his academic performance, sleeping with over 418 girls in the course of his life. This impacts him into adulthood where he couldn't remain faithful to his wife, so they divorced and he subsequently receives treatment for his alcohol dependency. Despite this, he was the most popular boy at school and quote-unquote fell in love with Lux because she didn't return his affection. Tripp was baffled why the only girl he liked was the only girl he couldn't have. Truer than all subsequent loves because it never had to survive real life still plagued him, even now in the desert with his looks and health wasted. Although there's something to be said about men liking the chase and women liking the pursuit, Tripp's case is different as we can observe what he does to Lux. Mrs. Lisbon preferred letting their daughters date during the day in public open air with supervision because, as she says, the darker urges of dating could be satisfied by frolic in open air love sublimated by lawn darts. When Lux found out she was allowed to go on a date with Trip, she ran up to her father and hugged him, kissing him with the unselfconsciousness affection of a little girl. This stands in contrast to how the girls felt insecure at prom because their dresses were unlike the other girls. They were more modest and wore less makeup, which made them feel unattractive. This contrast between the new and old worlds made them conscious of themselves, and they couldn't see how they were regarded as the prettiest girls in the school for their old world appeal. During prom, Tripp sneaks away with Lux and starts giving her alcohol to lower her inhibitions. Her older sister Bonnie ditches her date to follow Lux and makes sure that she's safe. But her date follows behind Bonnie and takes Tripp's bottle when offered and shoves it in Bonnie's face. After Tripp and Lux keep drinking and start kissing, Bonnie's date, Joe Connolly, pushes a kiss on Bonnie, later bragging to his friends about how her soul tasted like woe. However, this didn't leave a lasting impact and the girls asked the boys simple questions like why they asked them out and if they believed in God. Little did they notice Lux and Tripp sneak off after Tripp urged Lux onto the football field. Despite her discomfort over having to leave soon and her father's present supervision, Tripp managed to show her where he tackled a fellow footballer earlier that day and that same spot they had sex. When the lights overhead came on, Lux freaked out and began to cry, saying, I always screw things up, I always do. Which annoyed Tripp and he ditched her on the field, walking back home, expressly saying how he didn't care how she got back home. He even remarks upon how weird his feelings were because he liked her, but he was disgusted by her in that moment, even though her memory haunts him to this day. Lux's story is reflective of Lucretia, a noblewoman of ancient Rome whose death precipitated a rebellion that changed Rome from a monarchy to a republic during the 6th and 5th centuries before Christ. Tarquin, the Roman king's son, during battle took up residence in Caledonus' home, a Roman governor, where Lucretia, his daughter, lived while her husband was off in battle. Colatinus treated Tarquin with hospitality and even treated him like a son, which is an exchange also characteristic of how Mr. Lisbon treated Tripp while Tripp asked Mr. Lisbon's permission to take out Lux. And both men remarked upon Lucretia's virtue, just as Mr. Lisbon and Tripp remarked upon Lux's virtue. One night, Tarquin snuck into Lucretia's room and tried convincing Lucretia that she should sleep with him. As Dionysus the historian describes, using every argument likely to influence a woman's heart. She refuses until he gives her an ultimatum. Either she sleeps with him out of her own will, or he kills both her and another slave, lays the slave next to her body, and makes it seem like the two are having an affair. Lucretia finally submits, and Tarquin violates her. She runs to her father the next day, weeping, and takes her own life in front of him and her maidens, demanding vengeance for his crime done against her. And whereas I, for I am a woman, shall act in a manner which is fitting for me, you, if you are men, and if you care for your wives and children, exact vengeance on my behalf, and free yourselves, and show the tyrants what sort of woman they outraged, and what sort of men were her menfolk, 
This contrasts with St. Augustine's opus, God State, which highly influenced the Roman Empire, where he condemned suicide explicitly in the case of women who had been sexually violated because it only serves to double harm the body, and he comforted women by claiming that spiritual values would not be lost even if the body had been subjected to abuse. Pain exists to be suffered, and one should not commit a sin against oneself because of suffering. Lux's violation might be interpreted as consensual in the modern day, where girls commonly make peace with the idea of losing their virginity to a guy who later loses interest and leaves. But in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 28 and 29, it says in the original Hebrew and later King James Version, If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and may be found, then the man that lay with her shall give her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. This passage is sometimes translated as, If a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married, and rapes her, and they are discovered, he shall pay her father fifty shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives, like in the New International Version. Liberals will often argue this condones rape and posits women as sexual objects in the Bible, but quite the contrary. The act of having sex with a woman outside of marriage, outside of seeing her as your wife, treats the woman as a sex object, since the man can just treat her with the same respect he treats anything he can take sexual gratification from. However, this law upholds that a man must marry a virgin if he has sex with her, to protect her heart and pay her father for the inconvenience of disrespecting his daughter before marriage. If this passage regarded an act of rape, he would have been condemned to death under the law. However, this passage is in reference to a man having sex with a virgin and taking her virginity. This basically means that under the law, that man was now required to marry her because he had sex with her, she's not a sex object. This text is meant to protect women from the modern debaucheries we see nowadays where girls are shamed for romanticizing love and instead forced to face a collapsing society that identifies sexual degeneracy as culture and gaslights women into believing biblical principles are actually detrimental to women, much like the serpent who seduced Eve away from eternal life and into her grave. It's worth noting, this wouldn't have happened if the Lisbons had remained steadfast with their rules, instead of listening to the therapist counsel about letting the girls conform to the times. Lux developed the same hypersexual tendencies Trip developed after he was sexually exploited, and started having sex with any man who showed her attention, on top of her parents' roof, including adults. Those same men later said how Lux appeared very physically sick, losing her hair, growing very skinny, having very acidic saliva from alcohol abuse, and despite eagerly inviting these men over, she didn't look like she really liked her experience. She, however, would say pleading things like, put it in just for a minute, it'll make us feel close. She used makeshift products as contraceptives like vinegar, tomato juice, foul rags, and even had sex on the roof in the middle of winter. It was very clear she was self-destructive and hurting herself, but none of these men cared and used her anyways. They couldn't see the true damage they were doing to her since sex was seen as a consumerist activity rather than a spiritual act, and with time, Lux died inside, losing all hope and love and only seeing herself as a sex object. She later had to fake an appendix burst to privately seek a pregnancy test where her doctor ran a secret gynecological exam on her and discovered she had contracted HPV at 14. She often broke down crying at school, hiding behind lockers and bathroom stalls, holding herself shaking and crying, which confused her fellow peers. They all blamed Cecilia's death for Lux's mental breakdown, and all the Lisbon girls were further ostracized from the other girls, but further pursued by the other boys. Mrs. Lisbon then took them out of school for their protection, because she knew they weren't healing properly at school, and in fact it was making them worse. Mrs. Lisbon takes the girls to her mother's house for help, where their grandmother talks about her own misfortune at the hands of love some 60 years earlier. You never get over it, she said, but you get to where it doesn't bother you so much. The damage had been done. When Lux took her life, she used her sexual charms to stall the neighbor boys. Meanwhile, her sisters took their lives and enjoyed fantasizing about a romantic escape with them. But unfortunately, Lux no longer believed in love and only indulged in romantic fantasies as a means to cope with reality. The other three sisters struggled with reality in their own ways. Bonnie became more socialist and struggled with the nature of capitalism, reading Portrait of a Lady, which explored a young woman grappling between the old and new worlds as opportunists tried taking advantage of her. Mary painted watercolor scenes of modernist urban decay, and Therese was tasked with applying to different colleges but seemingly couldn't figure out where to go even if she wanted to attend. All of these girls struggled with society's paradigm shift, and they weren't the only ones. An immigrant grandmother who lived in the neighborhood, who survived watching her family get tortured by the Turks, who watched men get tortured to death, and who lived off of olives in a cave until she escaped to the United States, 
watched over the Lisbon girls, knowing they understood true suffering, and commented how common taking one's life is in Russia, where teenagers commonly threw themselves off bridges every winter. It's crucial to note that this was during the Soviet Union, where they actively suppressed Christianity under socialist rule, comparable to how capitalism replaced Christianity in the United States. Despite her traumatic life, she didn't take her life, but she does say how the world is dying and the Lisbon girls didn't have much to live for in the new world. Owing to extensive layoffs at the automotive plants, hardly a day passed without some despairing souls sinking beneath the tide of the recession. Men found in garages with cars running or twisted in the shower still wearing work clothes. Only murder-suicides made the papers, and then only on page three or four. Stories of fathers shotgunning their families before turning the guns on themselves. Descriptions of men setting fire to their own houses after securing the doors. This reflects real life where there was an uptick of American men freshly laid off from work who couldn't secure another job that then found themselves so psychologically ruined that they took their own life and sometimes the lives of their family, believing their family might financially struggle in the future without them or leave him for a new man. Likewise, all the trees in the neighborhood, allegedly sick, were cut down, leaving the town looking flat, impersonal, and washed out. The Lisbon girls tried protecting the elm tree in front of their own house with Cecilia's handprint inside the hollow. The tree once resembled a figure reaching up to the heavens with a green crown, but the city workers cut off its arms, leaving it looking like a gray pillar when the Lisbon girls wrapped themselves around the trunk. The city workers left their tree for last and finished off the rest of the street, claiming they had to take down the sick trees to protect the healthy trees, even though they cut down all of the trees on the street. At the encouragement of psychologists, the school ended up implementing a day of grieving, where students were reminded to just reminisce and reflect over losses and over pain. However, Mr. Lisbon was ironically laid off during the day of grieving, meant to help people dealing with loss because he couldn't emotionally cope with the grief of his daughter. And his daughters also, while still attending school, were often excused from class because they couldn't cope with the subject material being broached. So as the boys noted, the day of grieving really only applied to those who didn't have any pain or loss to cope with and was utterly useless and pretty much just performative. In the end, the Lisbon girls left copies of the same Virgin Mary card Cecilia held when she first attempted to end her life all over the neighborhood at night, warning everyone about the crumbling world. The boys noted how the Virgin Mary had the beatific expression of someone on lithium, which draws parallel to how therapy culture poorly tries to explain suffering and reconstructs secular methods to challenge or silence it, meanwhile Christianity naturally provides a sense of peace. The girls make an altar for Cecilia and then jointly take their lives. Mary actually survives her attempt and lives for another month, but later successfully takes her life while wearing an outfit similar to Jackie Kennedy's funeral dress. Everyone in town pretty much chalks up their deaths as being inevitable, particularly Mary's death, and they don't really attempt to encourage them to live. They don't really attempt to um, give them any sense of life because at the end of the day, they just consider them to be mentally unwell and pretty much destined for their fates. A therapy culture grows parallel to the Lisbon girl's pain, especially in the wake of Cecilia's death, where news companies kept sensationalizing Cecilia's death and trying to basically market it alongside the deaths of other teenagers who were now popping up. Therapists discuss how a lack of serotonin production explains why some people take their lives and encourage patients to take chemical substitutes, but this theory proves flawed when they test Mary's serotonin level and it turns out normal. They then interview a bunch of students who had been rigorously um, attending therapy sessions as they break down their mental complexes and why they arise, but the other students notice how they were regurgitating therapy talk and weren't actually fixed or weren't actually improving, but rather more so brainwashed by their exposure and even more so distanced from, or removed rather, from the reality of their suffering and couldn't provide any accurate or insightful perspective on their pain or as to why it was that so many people were now dying. They blamed the Lisbon parents for their strict upbringing, but this theory is challenged when a wave of teenage self-inflicted deaths across the country inundate the papers. However, this blame game costs the Lisbons their marriage, and Mr. Lisbon blames Mrs. Lisbon for the death of their daughters. Mrs. Lisbon is also noted as having a very similar appearance to her daughters after she buries Mary, the last of her daughters, as the boys note that she now had similar eyes to her daughters, she now had a similar countenance as her daughters, but this is to be noted mostly because since she no longer had that maternal instinct necessary since she buried the last of her daughters, that maternal instinct was basically a reflection of what she had endured, what she had seen, and her trying to anticipate that to protect her daughters. Now without the need for her to have that instinct to protect her daughters, that same sense of maiden-like quality 
transferred back into Mrs. Lisbon. And everyone in town considered Mrs. Lisbon to be the bad guy or to be the hard-handed mother. But in the end, she was actually the one doing her best to protect her daughters and knowing what kind of threats were going to present themselves, threats that ended up consuming her daughters' lives. The town blames the Lisbon girls for the demise of their suburb and the general sense of misery that hangs over them until they realize the Lisbon girls didn't cause this pain, but rather they saw the pain coming. As the book says, more and more people forgot about the individual reasons why the girls may have killed themselves, the stress disorders and insufficient neurotransmitters, and instead put the deaths down to the girls' foresight and predicting decadence. People saw their clairvoyance in the wiped out elms, the harsh sunlight, the continuing decline of our auto industry. This transformation and thinking went largely unnoticed. However, because we rarely ran into one another anymore. Their community died, as it also goes on to say. In the end, the torturers carrying the Lisbon girls pointed to a simple reasoned refusal to accept the world as it was handed down to them, so full of flaws. The girls did not end their lives because their parents didn't let them socialize and conform like the other kids. They ended their lives because without a shared sense of community, faith, identity, society, and consequently an economy that reflects the health of one's social fabric, life becomes very disorienting, empty, and isolated. Without God, what's the point to life except suffering? Much like the Stoics, they took their lives instead of living in dishonor in the new world to come. As the Catholic priest who buried Cecilia remarks, quote unquote, suicide as a mortal sin is a matter of intent. It's very difficult to know what was in those girls' hearts, what they were really trying to do. In a society without God, all you have is pain, and those who try to make sense of that pain without God are oftentimes charlatans, trying to drown you into their constant renewal, constant mishmash patchwork of explaining something that, at the end of the day, is inexplicable. At the end of the day, without God, you can't possibly fathom the true depth of the human condition. The only reason the secular society doesn't like using the Bible or God in arguments is because the truth within those scriptures are irrefutable and the idea of using them as an ultimate trump card against their individual and empty perspectives of the world it automatically invalidates them so it's very necessary to remember god and his law because anyone who tries taking that away from you is threatening your life what are you doing here honey you're not even old enough to know how bad life gets obviously doctor you've never been a 13 year old girl <laughs>